Thanks very much, Joe. So thank you to the organisers, in particular Joe, for inviting the Law Council of Australia to participate in today's seminar. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on as part of the world's oldest continuing cultures and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. My presentation today expands on one recently given at the Australian Defence College on the topic of artificial intelligence and associated technologies and their impacts on legal practice. The provocative question posed is whether AI will bring an end to lawyers. The implication for the legal profession of technological change, including AI, is a topic that I've been asked to cover in a number of fora during the course of my tenure as the Law Council President, because at the commencement of that tenure, I indicated a particular interest in the future of legal services and the obligation of the Law Council to concentrate its collective mind. I believe that my message will be consistent across all the settings and contexts within which the members of the legal profession can be found, including Defence Legal, whose lawyers provide legal advice and other legal services as members of a national legal practice specialising in military law and the military justice system, as well as other areas in domestic law. In September this year, I convened a Law Council Summit on the future of the legal profession, which brought together thought leaders of the profession, academics, members of the judiciary, legal practitioners, regulators, legal assistance providers and technology innovators. One of the things that we did in that summit was to proceed in a facilitated way to hear from everyone in the room. And I make that point because no one person has uh, what begins to, to be all the answers. In fact, that summit led us to a lot of questions and not uh, to all of the answers. And we reflected on the fact that we needed to do the same thing all over again uh, with a room full, there was 100 people, with a room full of under 30 year olds, whereas most of us were over 30, so we could identify the questions, we just didn't have all the answers. We looked at, at issues that will be significant in shaping the future of the pr profession uh, through the lenses of the experience of consumers of legal services, which is probably the most critical issue, the characteristics of the profession itself and the ethical and regulatory environment that surrounds the profession, the practice of law and the provision of legal services. Technological innovation was recognised as a significant driver of change across all these three lenses, although it was not seen as the only uh, driver, though the significant one. What I was looking at to get from our summit were insights into the key policy questions the Law Council, as the national peak body for the legal profession, needs to address to help shape and facilitate and manage the risks arising from the transformations that are now happening in the practice of law and provision of legal services. A lot has been said by futurists and other commentators about big trends facing the legal profession in the years to come that will fundamentally change the profession and the way law is practised. The number of these trends varies from commentator to commentator, which might tell you something. Uh, sometimes three, sometimes nine, sometimes ten groundbreaking trends are said to be evident. Also, sweeping statements abound. Digital transformation is revolutionising every industry, product and service industries alike. Uh, relentless disruption. Uh, the legal profession is undergoing a paradigm shift and the legal hyperchange becomes the rule, not the exception, to quote a few. Of course, these types of statements are not particularly helpful. Something we quickly realised is that we need to, to step back, as it were, from the hype of commentators and futurists that surrounds new technology and take a deeper look at what is really happening. Just as supply is linked to demand, the legal profession is inextricably linked to consumers. Essentially, we couldn't have one without the other. When I use the term consumer, I'm using it as a descriptor for anyone who, who uses or needs to use legal services. Our summit looked at who the future legal consumers might be and how AI and associated technologies and other trends and developments might impact them. It is said that community expectations are changing 
as a result of the digital revolution. If people can book appointments with doctors or hairdressers online 24-7, if they can transact electronically with banks and other financial services providers, if they can have documents and reminders sent directly to their electronic devices, why shouldn't they be able to do the same when it comes to accessing legal services? The picture painted is that people are becoming more familiar with and expect mobile and flexible services designed around the way they live and work. Yet the reality is that there is a significant digital divide in Australia. The Australian Digital Included Inclusion Index 2017 reported that in general, Australians with, low, Australians with low levels of education and income and employment are significantly less digitally included. And the gap between low and high income households as it widens uh, and the gap between older and younger Australians is also a factor. Particular geographic communities are experiencing digital uh, exclusion. There is a disparity, therefore, amongst the community about access, affordability and digital ability that needs to be addressed. So when looking at the impact of AI and associated technologies on access to and delivery of legal services to consumers, as well as access to justice more broadly, we cannot presume all consumers can have the same experience with technology. From our perspective, there will still be a place for the traditional bricks and mortar personalised legal services models, especially among those members of the community experiencing digital exclusion. We also recognise that the term artificial intelligence is not especially helpful to us when thinking about the impact technology-based legal tools will have on legal services uh, uh, and the consumers uh, and the legal profession. The Australian Human Rights Commission released an issues paper in July this year on human rights and technology, which pointed out that there is no universally accepted definition of AI. AI is a convenient expression that refers to a computerised form of processing information that more closely resembles human thought than previous computers have ever been capable of. That is, AI describes the range of technologies exhibiting some characteristics of human intelligence. However, a distinction needs to be made between narrow AI and artificial general intelligence. Narrow AI refers to today's AI systems, which are capable of specific, relatively simple tasks, such as searching the internet or navigating a vehicle. Artificial general intelligence, on the other hand, is largely theoretical today. It would invo involve a form of AI that can accomplish sophisticated cognitive tasks on a breadth and variety similar to humans. It is difficult to determine when, if ever, artificial general intelligence will exist, but predictions tend to be between 2030 and 2100, if at all. The Commission's paper went on to note that AI applications that are being integrated into daily life are examples of narrow AI. These include applications and tools such as chat box, natural language processing tools that allow us uh, to book taxis and make appointments, and tools that guide the user through decision-making trees and choices when they fill in forms. There are many technology-based legal products and services that can now be accessed by consumers without the involvement of a legal practitioner that are examples of narrow AI. For example, pre-programmed logic can be built into a system that navigates a user through a set of queries relevant to their legal issue, where the path is based on answers to earlier questions. It is possible for such tools to direct a user to the appropriate legal team or service, to provide legal information relevant to their issue, to prepare a draft document such as a will that takes into account their individual circumstances and preferences, to complete a form with their individual details and so forth. The logic of such systems is, pro is programmed into the system. The intelligence really lies in the human programmer and those that that person or people may consult rather than the system itself. Nevertheless, such tools can replace roles that might otherwise have been played by a lawyer or by administrative staff. 
Other examples include legal chat services, guided legal information tools based on common questions and answers, and tools that assist a self-represented person who intends, for example, to plead guilty to a charge, to prepare a document to assist the court in its sentencing decision. These tools provide new pathways to legal information, processes and solutions that, as I said, do not rely on the consumer having to engage a legal practitioner, although many law practices can and do use these, these kinds of tools within their own practice or make them available to consumers generally. For consumers who do need to engage the services of a legal practitioner, communications technologies such as encrypted email, uh, perhaps subject now to the new encryption laws enacted by the Commonwealth, authentication, uh, authentication tools and video conferencing tools such as Skype uh, et al enable lawyers and their clients to communicate and consult without having to meet at a physical office. These kinds of communication technologies are significantly valuable to consumers in rural, regional and remote areas of Australia uh, where the chronic shortage of legal practitioners and the great distances and costs involved in travelling present major barriers to, to access to justice and legal services generally. Uh, and on the point of Triple R, uh, our recent justice project published by the Law Council tells us uh, that uh, about 30% of Australians live outside of major cities at 7.1 million, but only about 10.5% of practising lawyers are in those regions. Australia's courts are also embracing technology. In July 2014, the Federal Court of Australia began implementing electronic court files, replacing paper files as the official record for proceedings in the Federal Court. The court's adoption of technology-based solutions now extends to electronic document management, electronic delivery, computerised equipped courtrooms and video conferencing, which allows for testimony being given, appearances and submissions to be made and judgments delivered through video link. That, co that court uh, can be contrasted uh, with some of the, the state courts uh, that are off the pace. Law practices are also increasingly utilising back office technology products to assist in file and document management, identification and management of conflicts of interests between clients and in data analytics to examine large volumes of documents and emails as part of the discovery process in litigation. So while these technology tools can improve efficiency and reduce the cost of legal services, we need to keep in mind the limitations and risks of relying too heavily on narrow AI-based tools. One of the limitations is that in general the community's knowledge of the law and legal process is very variable. While people are aware that they may have obligations and rights and protections under the law, they may not know the intricacies sufficiently well to traverse the labyrinth of legal principles required to advocate for their protection of their rights. The current crop of technology-based tools can assist in straightforward tasks but are not capable of dealing with the complexity and nuances of the law and its apl application to the unique and cl complex circumstances of individuals. So the usefulness of a particular technology-based tool is very much specific to the circumstances of the individual and given that our services are driven by consumers, it's a very important thought to hold on to. Another way of putting it is that we need to keep in mind that the practice of the law is essentially a human practice. And in our discussions this morning, we reflected on the fact that aspects of war warfare uh, are necessarily, uh, or necessarily fall to human judgment, which is the same principle when it comes to law. A lawyer needs to understand and appreciate the particular circumstances, perspectives and objectives of the client and the client accepts that the lawyer will apply knowledge and skills to ethically guide the client's matter through the legal process and system. In this sense, providing legal advice and legal services is not a transactional process, process that can be completely, if, if ever, automated. And indeed, when it comes to AI and automa automa uh, automation, it tends to be these transactional areas that are most vulnerable. So we look at technology as an, an enabler for but not a replacement of the application of the skills of the legal practitioner in service to their clients in the courts. Firms around the world 
have improved the way they conduct legal research by using systems like ROS, developed by IBM. It's a tool that allows legal practitioners to use natural language to ask questions rather than use keywords. ROS then provides citations and suggests topical readings from a variety of sources. It's derived from uh, similar programs for the medical profession. These types of systems are designed to s simulate human thinking, but are not creative and not cap capable of independent thought. Both of these qualities are essential for the legal profession and legal practice. AI is incapable of developing creative legal arguments that are needed in both contentious and non-contentious matters. Its ability to interpret information and the subtleties of language and styles of communication is also extremely limited. We were just reflecting before in another circumstance about uh, Donahue and Stevenson. One wonders whether an AI, well, an AI could not take the law as it was then to advance it into that type of decision making because it requires completely uh, human thought. Although robots might come up with a short list of relevant precedent statutes and regulations, they lack the ability to make a persuasive argument that takes the context into account, the individual circumstances of a client, and most importantly, the human experience. From making the argument to a lender to reconsider repossessing the home of a client who is faci facing financial hardship, to acting on behalf of a state in an international commercial court or in making decisions in criminal cases, expert argument is required to show the complete picture. Without this, decision makers will be unable to dispense justice effectively. In 2016, in the US, uh, there was a case of Wisconsin versus Loomis, which illustrates the difficulty. In this uh, case, the court, in a sentencing hearing, relied upon results from the COMPASS system, which predicted the offender's likelihood of reoffending based on actuarial data of persons of the same background. On appeal, the use of these kinds of systems was acknowledged, but procedural safeguards need to be in place. The use of an algorithm-based system to predict an offender's likelihood of reoffending could only provide a statistically-based prediction that might assist, but could not be a substitute for a judge's, judge's intuition, instinct, and sense of justice in determining a, a sentence. It also raises, inevitably, at the topic that I won't go into here, but of um, algorithmic bias. This case is a timely reminder that the usefulness of technology-based tools needs to be assessed at the micro level, that is, how a particular tool has been designed and developed and its usefulness in a particular context, rather than at the macro level of this broad spectrum reference to AI. In summary, while narrow AI offers and in many t uh, contexts already delivers easier and more helpful ways of going about ordinary aspects of daily life. Caution is needed in its application to legal transactions and legal problems. No algorithm yet exists to replace lawyers and the work they do. The Australian legal profession is, to borrow a phrase, a broad church of over 65,000 barristers and solicitors practising law in a variety of settings and contexts. It may be greater than that, because not all lawyers require practising certificates, which is how we count uh, who's uh, practising in Australia. The largest proportion of solicitors, 69%, are to be found in the private legal profession. However, an increasing proportion of solicitors, now around 16%, can be found occupying in-house counsel and other legal roles within Australia's corporations. A significant proportion, about 10% of solicitors, can be found in government departments and agencies, including, of course, the lawyers here today providing a range of legal services to and within the armed forces and the Department of Defence. Our summit considered the implications of technology as an aspect of the changing demographics and characteristics of our own profession. The workplace is becoming more diverse by way of gender, race, age, sexual identity and other characteristics. Workplaces are increasingly embracing inclusive measures to ensure that they are equipped with the best and brightest and are able to best represent their clients' needs. Also, more individuals are seeking flexibility in the way of working to assist their family and other aspirations, like holidays, and in many cases value this over remuneration and traditional partnership rewards. 
Advances in technology are allowing professionals to be mobile and work remotely. Technology provides multiple ways of communication, communicating and accessing services 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and will be second nature to the next generation of legal practitioners and their clients. In order to meet client needs and the demand for legal services in the future, the profession needs the right number of lawyers with the right set of skills in the right locations at the right time. The incorporation of technology skills, in particular different forms of AI, into the legal curricula is an essential step towards ensuring that automation provides appropriate support for the legal industry. Most Australian universities offer technology-focused law courses. Many of these revolve around traditional subject matters where we've got to give legal advice. Intellectual property law and information technology law courses are obvious examples of traditional academic subjects that have had to adapt to understand the technological context of the fields in which those areas are placed. However, universities and practical legal training providers will also need to offer subjects that directly address technological literacy for law students. A degree of techn technological literacy will be essential to lawyers understanding how technology tools are designed, built and maintained, and to judge their usefulness and their limitations and the risks of deploying these tools. In other words, it's not about merely having an academic understanding of IP, it is understanding the operation of the technology. Technology in combination with other factors is also bringing about significant changes in the way law firms are organised and in the services they provide. Over the past few years, the expression new law model has come into vogue as a way of making a distinction with what we otherwise call trad law and big law, traditional law firms uh, and big law firm models. The new law model is characterised as an entity or set of arrangements which align human talent with legal tasks, including project-based, flexible or dispersed legal talent providers and managed legal support services that come together in combinations required to meet the needs of a particular client. Other described characteristics of the new law model are firms that use virtual workplaces, super temps, which means freelancers or lawyers with flexible work arrangements, a project-based approach, alternative fee arrangements and the active use of technology. The trad law and big law models structured as partnerships usually, utilising tiered rate, uh, time-based billing, billable hours, targets for employees and focused on technical legal excellence to a traditional client base were portrayed as the mode of the past, not the future. The distinction, however, is not universally accepted, particularly by Law Firms Australia that represents the, the largest uh, nine firms in Australia and has a directorship uh, at the Law Council table. For instance, uh, large Australian partnerships have in recent years embraced AI and virtual workplaces to improve the efficiency of legal services, partnered with research institutions to establish research centres focused on technology and law, established research and development teams within firms to oversee and develop innovative practices and technolog technologies to meet client challenges, created legal practices to support start-up companies, launched new technologies for legal practice, offered training to lawyers in computer coding and partnered in such activities as hackathons, where students and lawyers work together to develop uh, good responses to current challenges, uh, not hack people, which is a little misleading in the name. Having recently attended the New South Wales uh, Law Society Hackathon, uh, I was uh, corrected on what might be your initial understanding. Underpinning these modes of legal practice is the use of technologies to support new service models uh, such as online marketplaces. A recent report suggests that by 2020, it's expected that 45% of the Australian workforce will be part of the gig economy, including freelance lawyers uh, looking for short-term work contracts. And indeed, opening the Australian this morning, I read uh, that uh, half the jobs created in Australia uh, in the September quarter were in the gig economy, so we might be underestimating that figure. 
online law firms, the law practice on the laptop of a mobile lawyer without a permanent physical office. Sounds a bit like my year uh, this year as President of the Law Council. Unbundled legal services, almost also known as limited scope, discrete or limited retainer legal services directed at assisting the client with a specific issue or task but without the expectation of a traditional full coverage ongoing retainer uh, which has some professional or potential professional indemnity uh, issues attached to it in regards to risk and joined up services, a holistic client centric and convergent approach where technology systems can interact with one another and businesses and professions have the ability to meld legal and other professional services within multidisciplinary structures or other service arrangements. From a regulatory perspective, we recognise that regulation of the legal profession, the profession of legal services, rather the provision of legal services, has, generally speaking, evolved in response to problems after they have emerged. One of the key challenges as a profession is to work toward shaping a regulatory and ethical framework that is not simply reactive, but which fosters and accommodates innovation so that the benefits of developing and deploying new technology-based tools as well as new ways for lawyers to work, organise and provide legal services are encouraged and, reali and realised. Perhaps to put another way, uh, we should encourage our own innovation within reason uh, because if we don't, then non-regulated providers will step into the breach. In looking at regulatory responses to the growth of technology and new ways of working in the legal services industry, we must ensure that we do not regula regulate away the benefits for consumers, courts and the profession, nor should we stifle innovation and competition. If we are too conservative, we run a risk of devising overly protective and controlling regulatory measures. And you might say, looking at our regulations as they are today, that we might have done that. On the other hand, regulation of the legal profession and the provision of legal services serves the public interest in the administration of justice and the protection of consumers by ensuring quality of both the knowledge and skills of legal practitioners and the services they provide. Maintaining quality, therefore, means turning our attention to particular risks and challenge, challenges with technology-based legal products and services. For instance, how might we ensure that technology-based tools and services are the product of the application of highly specialised legal knowledge and skill by their creators? Does that require regulation? To what extent might legal practitioners be held responsible and accountable for the legal correctness of the technology-based products they use as they use ROS. What about version control? Because what you're told one day might be different the next. How might we ensure that a technology-based tool, particularly one that is designed for consumers to use without the concurrent advice of a legal practitioner is actually fit for purpose? How might we ensure that technology-based tools remain current given the law is constantly changing? Should a consumer be indemnified, and if so, how, if a technology-based product fails to deliver a legally correct and valid outcome? How do we ensure that technology-based tools and new ways of working in law appropriately protect client confidentiality, avoid conflicts of interest and meets our other ethical obligations? And how do we ensure that lawyers using technology-based tools have a sufficient understanding of what the tools do, how they work, and hence what their limitations are. While this may not require lawyers to be able to write and read computer code, it does require a degree of technological literacy that I referred to before. In other words, regulation is internal to the profession, but we might also look at it as an external challenge. Returning to the original question, uh, will AI bring about the end of lawyers? My answer is an unequivocal no. Technology-based legal tools and other drivers are bringing about positive changes to the profession, the practice of law and the value proposition for consumers. The bottom line for the profession is that technological change is a positive. It provides opportunities to improve the quality and reduce the cost of legal services. It provides opportunities for law practices to expand the range 
and connectedness of services. It provides new ways for legal practitioners to work and organise themselves. It provides new ways to interact with clients and it provides opportunities for consumers to undertake straightforward legal transactions themselves without always needing to resort to a legal professional. It needs to be understood that there's a significant unmet legal need in Australia. Uh, in the words of the Federal Product Productivity Commission, uh, and, uh, a missing middle. So as lawyers, particularly in private practice, we don't need to be concerned about the fact that uh, consumers of legal services might access those services in other than a face-to-face -face environment, because they are the, probably the people who don't currently walk through our law firm doors and yet require legal services. Our challenge as a profession is to embrace the benefits of technological innovation and change while also recognising and accommodating the limitations and the risks. We need to ensure that we don't get carried away by the hype that surrounds AI, but approach it with our eyes wide open. I'll finish um, because I'd like to engage in discussion, if we may, uh, by relating a very interesting article by Rodney Brooks, published in the November-December 2017 issue of the MIT Technology Review, entitled The Seven Deadly Sins of AI Predictions. Uh, the sins, and I paraphrase them, are as follows. Overestimating the capability of a new technology when first introduced and underestimating its longer-term capabilities once mature, sin one. And this is very much, I think, a question of trying to balance not responding to all of the hype associated with uh, the so-called AI revolution, but not underestimating its important importance to legal services over time. Sin two, imagining magic. If we don't understand enough about imagined future technologies, we run the risk of not knowing their limitations. Three, performance versus competence. We can easily be misled by the capability of current technology to perform routine tasks or answer simple questions into believing the technology can replicate the complexities of human thought and understanding. Fourth, suitcase words. Words that can have a variety of meanings. When we apply the word learning, for example, to machine-based learning, we can erroneously assume that this learning process is the same as the rapid, sponge-like, human learning process. Next, exponentials, the belief that machine-based deep learning will regularly and continuously improve in capability without limitation. The sixth sin, Hollywood scenarios, the belief that a technology will suddenly come along and change the world, when the reality is that technolo technological and societal change is a gradual, interactive and adaptive process. And finally, speed of deployment, an erroneous belief that the world is already digital, while software can be rapidly changed and, and deployed, the same cannot be said for the physical infrastructure and equipment software operates, which takes considerable time and capital cost to be modified or replaced. Now that uh, ends uh, my uh, formal presentation, but I'd invite questions indeed discussion because one of the things I recognise from our summit uh, that we conducted at the Law Council in September, uh, it being a facilitated session, was that the answers actually came from the uh, floor, at least a lot of the questions did. So I think there's a roving microphone. I'd be happy to uh, accept questions, but also it'd be great to hear uh, your own thoughts. Basically, trying to 
build that, I suppose, the, the um, combination of uh, trust that the, the AI will be able to serve a, a client's need should you plead guilty to a charge, mm -hmm. should you do that. And also the, the issue of, of not sort of trying to overreach in, in, that, in, in the in terms of the risk, that in, in, in small, smaller transactions, legal transactions, there's going to be a market for the car payers to get mm -hmm. out there in front of the actual abilities of AI mm -hmm. to deliver proper, proper, proper legal advice. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that's entirely right. So. Uh, I'd like to take a more positive view, and that is that certain transactional uh, things will be able to be done through the use of technology, if I can use that more neutral term, and that's a good thing because uh, we don't want people paying for legal services or paying for a service they don't actually require, and as lawyers uh, in the private profession, uh, we're a relatively expensive commodity in part because of the overheads we carry. But there is a real concern, I think, arising uh, in the Law Council's mind and that of its constituent bodies about what you, what you refer to, which is unregulated providers. Hence, uh, the remarks made about the fact that we need to consider our own regulation essentially for two purposes. The first is uh, to ensure that we deal with the fact that we're going to be uh, utilising technology tools and so forth and to anticipate any regulation that might need to apply to us, but also to have an approach uh, to regulation that is sufficiently flexible to enable the legal profession uh, to offer some of these answers rather than just get marched over by un unregulated providers. Uh, the second aspect of regulation is to look at the regulation of unregulated providers. But if I can use an analogous example that has struck me over quite some years, it's in the class action uh, litigation funder area where uh, litigation funders are essentially unregulated. They can take up to 40% of the damages from a claim. We are highly regulated as a profession, but we are prevented in any way from being involved in the litigation funding because of perceived conflict of interest, which might be quite right, uh, but essentially because of regulatory reasons. So rather than move our regulation to accommodate that, uh, we simply sit on our hands. And uh, these are perhaps slightly controversial comments, but we don't want to be so conservative our, in our approach as to deal the legal profession out of the game when we're in fact highly regulated, highly ethical, and would be the one profession that could actually do that sort of stuff, understand the conflict, and help people with access to justice. Instead, we just leave it to a, to a, to a, to a, to a litigation funder who are there uh, for entirely capital-making purposes uh, without regulation, as an analogous example. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. Mark O'Neill from the Office of Chief of Army. Um, the history of technology has been that uh, lots of great techno te technological ideas haven't taken off because the consumer hasn't wanted them. Mm. I, I have a sense, perhaps, and I'll offer this as a, for your reply, that your organisation and the constituency you represent ultimately might not get much of a say in this, and that the consumer will decide if his technology mm. has merit, meets their purposes. Mm. Uh, I can remember listening to a radio national interview a few years ago from the taxi industry. And we've seen what's happened with Uber, mm. for example, and other, if you will, disruptive applications of technology. Mm. I wonder how you're going to react to where the market goes if it goes mm. away from your traditional mm. controls, for want of a better word. Uh, I completely agree. And the reason why we did this body of work and had the summit is precisely that. The first thing to understand is that we're no longer in a world uh, as we were, or some still think we are, where we tailor a product, a legal product, for clients that we think they need. Uh, in fact, clients will tell us what they require, and you're really provocatively posing the question as to whether or not 
the profession is so flat-footed that it won't respond. And I think the answer is that some will and some won't and there will be winners and there will be losers. But if we learn from other industries and we cannot think that the legal profession is immune to this, uh, and one thing that, is, that, that I can see with absolute clarity uh, is that consumers will be the ones to require of us the services they require because that's what they've done in every other industry. So uh, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, we just need to get on our toes. Not confident at all. Um, uh, the, uh, our federal parliament has been dealing with some of these issues with national security legislation during the, during the year. Uh, no, I think we're uh, very much playing catch up, but we are, I believe that we are generally aware of the risks. It's how to respond to them. Again, in a, in, by way of analogy, in a legal setting, the algorithms that might be being used by uh, say the uh, Metropolitan Police in London to, uh, to use facial recognition uh, technology, rely on algorithms uh, um, that uh, may have bias but also uh, may not uh, be very accurate. We don't really understand the basis on which they're, uh, they're being used, um, in other words how they are programmed, to a point where in Wisconsin and Loomis uh, when asked about how the algorithms had made the prediction, the answer given was that it was protected IP and could never be known because it was a trade secret. So obviously there are challenges in law when we are relying on that type of technology and in fact some of those issues were identified uh, in the AI and robotics uh, in warfare day uh, where I w was uh, privileged to present, but also led to this invitation, and some of those challenges were identified, including essentially the the, the morality and uh, and and the values we apply to warfare uh, when you are not when you're sitting somewhere else and causing harm. So, uh, I I think that uh, the, the it's a major challenge uh, for parliaments and. Uh, the legal profession and the law more broadly uh, to deal with some of the uh, things that we'll confront here. I, I noticed that the uh, Federal Parliament, the Australian Government has recently, and in some of its regulators, has recently and pleasingly stepped up to deal with some of the issues that uh, big data, for example, throw up and so forth, um, only today or yesterday, um, a report by the ACCC. So I, I uh, completely agree with that also. Uh, but, as usual, um, you can see the problem, but you can't necessarily come up with all the answers. Um, g'day. Thank you very much. Uh, I presume some of the legal profession believe these types of uh, automation technologies may be the key to um, some type of competitive advantage in respect to speed of decision, potentially. Mm. Um, in the legal profession, uh, how do you see them applying the technology or what sort of scenarios or, or how are they trying to test out the technology um, uh, and, and, and what's the mechanics of that that you see that might be applicable to defence? Would you have any advice to defence on how and especially the legal area in defence on how they might want to try and trial some of these technologies? Well, uh, I. Uh, not sure whether to interpret that as 
uh, how you might, as defence lawyers, use AI within your own practices, or whether, uh, or, or whether or not um, you're talking about military uh, systems. What struck me about the uh, day that we had about AI and robotics was how similar the challenges being explored in the professions of arms, the pre profession of arms, is to the challenges being considered by the profession of law. And uh, there are far more similarities. Indeed, it was, it, was, it was hard to find a difference in approach. And um, going to your point, uh, all of the questions that you could ask about law, you could also ask about uh, the, the, uh, the military. But as to how to use AI within our own practices, it's, I think it's trial and error to an extent. There are the statistics uh, about what law firms or how law firms are behaving uh, look like this. Uh, big successful firms are using AI and are more at the cutting edge because they can afford to fail and there's usually a technology leader embedded in the firm, usually with a team of people. Successful mid-sized firms aren't there yet. Uh, they are not using AI and they are still at the process-driven level. That is, trying to get, uh, ex uh, uh, trying to get um, the most out of, uh, the most efficiency out of process-driven technology. So it's still, the, it's still the, the employment of technology, but not, not the cutting edge of technology. And then, curiously enough, unsuccessful small firms will and are experimenting with AI. So the fact that they are unsuccessful small firms <laughs> might tell you something, uh, but I, I, I don't think there's a universal answer to that. And if, as defence lawyers, you were to use AI applications, such as some of what I've described here, it's a matter of understanding them and, and using them by trial and error. I, I don't think I can say more. Um, thanks for your presentation. It's been very insightful. Um, this is expanding a little bit on what you've just been talking about, but um, I was wondering if you can um, expand a little bit more about the effect that AI is going to have on legal practice in terms of um, big law firms being able to invest in that kind mm. of technology. For example, um, Freehills uh, this year collaborated um, to, um, to use blockchain to make contracts mm. be uh, much more efficient. Um, and obviously smaller firms will lag on that. Um, but like government agencies and in-house counsel might be able to step up and employ that kind of technology. I was wondering yes. how you see that divide affecting the legal industry. Well, the, the uh, legal industry has to be understood to be divided already in a sense. We have uh, at one, end, one side these, these mega firms that operate is essentially almost a different industry. And then about 85% of Australian lawyers uh, sole practitioners or small practices. This is in the private sphere, uh, but probably this is not entirely different in the corporate world where you get in-house counsel in large, very large corporations and then smaller corporations. And at the, at the bottom end uh, of the spectrum, you've got a cottage industry, really, uh, that are going to practise traditional law and probably for quite some time in the future. Uh, but the likelihood is uh, that uh, will all be taken forward by the use of technology. I think I reject the idea that because big firms are trialling this type of technology that they will necessarily hang on to it. See, innovative mid-sized firms will wait till they've made all the mistakes and then pick up the crumbs, which is what happened after the GFC because quite often you saw smaller mid-sized firms fall out of big firms that weren't particularly profitable at that particular point in time, um, six or seven Royal Commissions later and they're okay again. But uh, the smaller firms took areas of specialty away, or, or the uh, boutique mid-sized firms took areas of specialty away from big firms. So 
I, I take a view that uh, we will probably all move together, although you're always, as I said earlier, going to have winners and you're going to have losers because some won't be able to pick it up. But I'd be interested to know, say in three years' time, uh, of that analysis that Murray uh, Hawkins, who's here from the Law Council Secretariat, did uh, about uh, the response of firms big, medium and small, how that will have moved along, particularly in terms of the mid-sized firms and how they will be, at that stage, behaving. Because I suspect uh, that they will be picking up these types of technologies by then. The other th interesting thing is in, the pl in planning for the uh, Futures Summit, as we called it, we had a person uh, outside of uh, the legal industry. It was, it's, it's very helpful to have people outside your own industry. And uh, he was essentially a, a, sort of a futures capitalist. Uh, and um, he, uh, we were talking about the window where over which time things are going to change. Um, and we were talking about what, how, to, how to garner and prepare the legal profession for the next five to ten years. And he encouraged us and certainly made me think uh, that what we were doing was trying to prepare the legal industry for the next three years because things move so can move so rapidly that really you need to just continually look at it. And I'm hoping that the Law Council of Australia, having started this body of work, will stay on it because we need to assist the legal profession, understand the, the possibilities and so forth. Some of the big firms and big, or, big organisations, governments, agencies and so forth are, are going to do that in their own. But you need to recognise or as I now do, that 85% of the profession need to be helped, as it were. Just a, probably two questions, I'll be greedy. Um, first question is, most of the lawyers, I suppose, in the room here are in-house counsel. Mm. So I suppose, uh, do you have any sort of comments on AI in the context of in-house counsel, because my, my immediate reaction is that probably there's less things that can be automated for in-house counsel than other branches of the law. Mm. The other issue is, is more the philosophical question of, do you foresee, um, and you may already have sort of answered this question of, uh, legal AI having, having a, a role to play in use of force scenarios, uh, which, which, which is you know, the, one, of, one of the, the primary uh, things that military organisations or even police organisations uh, would, would be interested in. Uh, I suppose my comment before th th um, asking you to comment on that is I probably wouldn't see too much legal AI in, say, capital murder cases coming into, mm. into vogue in, in the US um, because people aren't going to do that sort of risk analysis. So I'm prepared to uh, you know, rely on, on uh, artificial intelligence in, in, those, in the, those sort of scenarios. Well, uh, in relation to the first point, I think it probably depends on what the in-house lawyer is doing uh, as to what uh, type of AI might help. And what, what we've come to understand in our research is that because you have these non-specific uh, banner descriptions, it's a bit hard to answer that without isolating what it is you do and therefore what application might help. And I'm quite sure there's applications that would help, but th that's part of what we... Uh, have begun to understand that it really needs, it's a bit horses for courses. As to the second point, it's really interesting because you could imagine uh, a world where, actually I think it's back to the future too, um, where, uh, where, where the, the professor says to the main character, uh, don't you know Marty, uh, justice can be decided in five minutes now, we've got rid of the lawyers. So you can, you can, you can imagine a world where predictive uh, technologies and algorithms might be able to do a really good job, that they might be able to get it right you know, more often than the human gets it right, maybe. We won't, it, it's, it's not currently capable of, of thought. It, it can't produce Donahue and Stevenson, but based on, on what's happened in the past, it's, it, it might get quite good. But the question is, just like in the use of... Uh, AI in warfare is when do we feel comfortable about using it and when do we require human judgment? So Joe Murray and I were having a discussion about this a little earlier and there might be quite good applications for AI in warfare where uh, you can identify uh, the hostile enemy and 
what's a friend in terms of an aircraft, but you've still got to make a human judgment uh, as to when you use particular uh, capabilities. So I, I think that AI, in the narrow sense, uh, could be quite, quite good, it could be quite sound. But society, I don't think, will ever accept in a capital murder case that machines should be going anywhere near it. So I think as a society, we also need to think about what is acceptable to us because if we look at Google and Facebook and where, it's, where they've advanced their position, we're, we're playing catch up on something we already know is going on. I just think it provokes a wider question beyond law for communi the community and society to say, what are the rules? We're, we're, what, what's, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. And I, I agree that uh, consumers are going to respond and drive this, but we also have a capacity to regulate and produce uniformity if we can. So uh, th there you uh, have, I think, a wider <laughs> philosophical discussion. You, you were saying there that consumers will drive it, and I see a, uh, that, that probably in my view that there's at least a constant demand for legal services. It's probably go, possibly going up over the years, but mm. people generally, want, I suppose myself, I want to avoid lawyers because mm. the expense right. that comes with it. When you look at the outcome and maybe what, yeah. you know, say for example, family law and the like, mm. people are trying to avoid lawyers. So yes. there's going to be an, a, there's going to be a huge market or a potential for mm. AI to come in and mm. feed that market, and mm. not just. Or are there other parts of the industry, other sort of mm. particulars like contract law or other areas where mm. they may be more prone to yes. AI coming in and doing that and providing yes. that service? Because the, uh, the result and outcome, if, even if you get a great lawyer versus a good lawyer, you might get a, it may not be much of a difference. So AI could serve that. There's a well, it's a, a good facts make good law. <laughs> um, so, uh, and you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, so it depends a bit on the matter. But um, uh, the... Uh, I, I think the answer to that is, again, uh, you're quite right, but what I've been struck with as President of the Law Council having gotten the second half of the Justice Project, which was the most exhaustive, exhaustive look at access to justice in Australia since probably the Sackville Poverty Inquiry in the 70s, produced a 1,500-page report that we published in, in, in August, is there is a vast amount of unmet legal need in Australia. One uh, community legal centre describes civil law as the problem, the legal problem that people don't recognise they have. So at this stage, I am quietly confident that we can have AI doing various things in that transactional area without face-to-face -face legal services necessarily suffering because of the extent of pent-up uh, access to justice or uh, access to legal services demand, indeed, to look at it in a positive way, it may enable people uh, to get something they can't presently afford. And as long as we regulate properly, uh, that's got to be regarded as a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, thank you very much, Maury, yeah. for coming out to uh, talk about um, how uh, AI has affected the legal mm. profession. Um, I think that point about uh, the need to introduce people from outside into um, different sectors and that cross-pollination is important it reminds me of a General George S. Patton quote, if we were all thinking the same then nobody's thinking. So I think uh, having people like Murray come along to talk to defence people about their experience uh, is really important. So if you could please join me in thanking Murray for coming. Thank out. you. Of course you can't leave. You can't leave, oh. you can't leave Air Force functions without gifts. Um, so the first thing is to give you, this is a hot off the press calendar, because as you know, we received two JSF on Monday. So <laughs> that hasn't actually gone out to the broader oh, right. you want to force perverse people and a small gift from the uh, Empower. Thanks very much. Thank you Thanks very much. much. Thank you.